Okay, so this week we have uh, Shahab from uh, McMaster University who's going to be telling us about uh, the Saddle Point Accountant for Differential Privacy, which is uh, exciting new work. Shahab has done a lot of great work in this space uh, since he did his PhD in at Queen's University in 2017. So thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Thomas, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you for uh, being here, um, all of you. Uh, okay, so um, I want to talk about Saddle Point Accountant for Differential Privacy. This is a, a new kind of accountant, new medical accountant for uh, for differential privacy. Um, it's a it's a joint work uh, with my colleague Flavio uh, from Harvard, Oliver and Alita from ASU, and uh, PhD student Weil and Felipe from uh, from Harvard. Uh, okay, so let me uh, begin by kind of motivating this work. Um, uh, the state-of-the-art numerical composition algorithm uh, in DP uh, is, is this paper by Gopi et al. from last year, Norips. Um, so what this paper actually did was uh, they proposed a new uh, uh, numerical algorithm for approximating uh, composition, um, like, like approximating the privacy guarantee of uh, composition of a DP mechanism. Uh, in particular, they give lower band and upper band for the privacy guarantee. So. As an example, uh, if we look at you know the DPSGD uh, with this parameter, so the uh, noise uh, standard deviation is 0.65, the subsampling rate is 10 to minus two, and uh, I fix you know the uh, delta uh, parameters to uh, 10 to minus five, then uh, this upper bound and lower bound uh, will be uh, something like this. So the y-axis is epsilon, the x-axis is the number of composition or the number of iteration for DPSGD, and as you can see, the lower bound and upper bound are pretty close to each other. Meaning that you know we have a very tight uh, understanding of the privacy guarantee of DPSGB. Okay, but there is one issue with this uh, with this algorithm, and that is the runtime complexity. So uh, they show that the complexity of this algorithm uh, increases with n uh, with this order. So it basically just o root n times log of uh, log of n. So if the number of composition, uh, which is n here, if the number of composition is sufficiently large, then this algorithm uh, might be very expensive to uh, to implement. Um, I have to say that uh, very recently, just a few months ago, uh, this paper actually uh, shows that you know in ICML 2022, they showed that the complexity of this algorithm actually can be improved to polylog n, but it's still you know it increases with n. This is actually one issue of this state of the art uh, algorithm. There is actually another issue with this algorithm, and then to see that, let's just look at the delta versus epsilon plot. So here I'm fixing the number of composition to be 2,000, and I'm showing a delta versus epsilon. So again, the gap between lower bound and upper bounds is great. So that means you know there is a very good um, a kind of uh, understanding for the privacy guarantee. But now let me just increase uh, uh, sigma from 0.65 to 1. Okay, what happened is that the uh, the algorithm actually breaks at some point. So at this point the algorithm stops working. Um, and what it says is that uh, the algorithm cannot really work efficiently for all range of epsilon and delta. And this happens because of you know, some uh, sort of floating, uh, a floating point error in the algorithm. So this is, uh, this, is, this is actually one kind of uh, rather serious issue. Uh, if the true values of epsilon is something like you know, 10 to minus eight, 10 to minus nine, this algorithm stops working. Uh, so the goal of today's talk is uh, I want to introduce a new numerical composition algorithm for uh, for DP based on saddle point approximation, which does not have these two issues. Uh, in particular, the runtime complexity is independent of the number of composition, and uh, it works for all values of epsilon and delta. So now let's just uh, just quickly compare, you know, this uh, this this uh, uh, saddle point accountant. Uh, compared with the with the Gopi et al. Um, so uh, here the uh, the yellow curve uh, is the saddle point approximation uh, accountant. So uh, the, again, the y axis is epsilon, the x axis is the number of uh, composition. And as you can see, this new uh, accountant kind of sits between the lower bound and upper bound from Gopi et al. So uh, from the accuracy perspective, um, this new accountant is compatible with uh, with the state of the art while the runtime complexity is all one. So it doesn't really depend on the number of composition. Okay, so, so it doesn't have you know, the first issue. And then for the second issue, uh, this is, this is uh, delta versus uh, epsilon curve. Um, um, as you can see, there is no breaking point in this new uh, accountant. So 
Uh, again, so at this point, Gopi et al. algorithm just breaks, but uh, this new saddle point accountant uh, basically just uh, works you know, for any values of epsilon and delta. Okay, so uh, that that is actually the motivation. So now let's just jump to the problem and then uh, kind of define this saddle point accountant uh, more formally. And let uh, let me define uh, differential privacy. I know you all all familiar with, with DP, but just just in case, uh, suppose you know we have a data set B. We compute some statistic from this data set. We pass it through some privacy uh, mechanism M. The output is uh, is a distribution which I denoted by this MD. And now uh, let me construct a neighboring data set. I compute some statistic, the, the same statistic on this data set B prime, pass it through this mechanism, and then the output will be another distribution which I denoted by MD prime. We say that this mechanism is epsilon delta DP if for any pair of neighboring data set B and D prime, this condition is satisfied. Meaning that the probability uh, of any even A under MD and MD prime are kind of you know, similar. Okay, uh, so the left-hand side of this, uh, this, this condition uh, is sometimes called hockeyistic divergence. So the supremum of, of this, uh, the subtraction of MDA minus E to the epsilon times MD prime is sometimes called the, uh, the hockeyistic divergence between these two distribution M and B and MD prime. So compactly, I can say that the mechanism is uh, epsilon delta DP if the hockeyistic divergence between these two distribution is smaller than delta, for any pair of neighboring data set B and D prime. And uh, the reason I'm using this um, not so popular definition of DP is because a hockeyistic divergence uh, is known to have a bunch of equivalent expression, and some of those expression actually is very important for the, uh, for the composition analysis. Uh, okay, so let me uh, make a few more definition. Um, so uh, we say that a pair of uh, distributions P and Q uh, is to dominate a mechanism M if the hockeyistic divergence between MD and MD prime is a smaller than the hockeyistic divergence between P and Q. And again, for any pair of neighboring data set B and D prime. And if this inequality happens to be equality for all values of epsilon, then we say that this pair of distribution tightly dominates mechanism M, okay? Um, so the reason why this, this definition is very important is because it gives us a very powerful tool uh, to, uh, to compute a very important quantity in DP, which is the privacy curve. Okay, So a privacy curve uh, that I denote by this delta of epsilon is basically the smallest delta such that a mechanism uh, is epsilon delta DP. So this is the optimal privacy guarantee achieved by this mechanism. F. Okay, so. Uh, this, this definition, this tightly dominating distribution actually allows us to kind of compute this, this privacy curve in a very kind of efficient way. Um, so if I know a pair of tightly dominating distribution for a mechanism M, then, then I can say that the privacy curve for that mechanism is just equal to the hockeyistic divergence between P and Q. Okay, so now we have a very kind of compact, nice representation for the privacy curve. Okay, and now here it comes an equivalent uh, expression for the hockeyistic divergence. We can show that this hockeyistic divergence can be can be represented by this expectation. So the expected uh, of uh, this, you know, the positive term of this term, and by positive term I mean if if this term is negative, we just replace it by zero, and if it's positive, I just you know, keep it as is. And and this expectation is with respect to this random variable L which is the log of the log likelihood uh, or the, the, the logarithm of the uh, random negative derivative of P over Q evaluated at this random variable X, uh, which is distributed according to uh, distribution P. Okay, so all we have to do, you know, we have to find the tightly dominating distribution for M, compute this, this expectation, and that gives us, you know, the privacy care for that mechanism. Okay, uh, so this is uh, for tightly dominating distribution uh, if, oh yeah, so okay, so and then uh, this random variable is sometimes called privacy loss random variable. Okay, but uh, what happens if we don't have tightly dominating distribution? If we don't have tightly dominating distribution and we have only dominating distribution, instead of equality here, we have an upper bound for the privacy curve. Okay, so, um, so in, in any case, if we have dominating, we, we have an upper bound. If we have tightly dominating, we have basically just the equality for the privacy curve. Okay, so now let's just have an example for this uh, for this definition. Let's just look at the uh, DPSGD. 
Uh, the most basic and the most popular uh, uh, version of DPSGB works as follows. At each iteration, uh, we do some subsampling with some subsampling rate. Uh, and then for each batch that we just subsample, uh, we compute the gradient. And then uh, we do some uh, clipping on that, uh, on that gradient, you know, according to this constant C. And then uh, we add Gaussian noise to the clipped gradient. And um, in order to have epsilon, D, epsilon delta dp, you know, the variance of the noise, the variance of the Gaussian noise depends on the, on the clipping. Um, so it, it's very easy to show that each iteration of this mechanism can be modeled by subsample Gaussian mechanism. And also for this subsample Gaussian mechanism, we can easily show that, you know, this P and Q are tightly dominating distribution. So Q is just uh, the simple Gaussian distribution and P is uh, the convex combination of uh, the standard Gaussian and um, a Gaussian distribution with mean is, uh, is uh, equal to C. And now here, this little p is uh, basically the subsampling rate. It's just some number between zero and one. So now that we know the tightly dominating distribution for each iteration of DPSGB, we can say that the privacy curve for each iteration is actually equal to the Hockey-Sig divergence between p and q, which is, uh, is, which is equal to this expectation. And this privacy loss random variable in this particular case can be written as, uh, as something like this. Okay, so now this gives us a very tight um, uh, kind of expression for the privacy curve of, of each iteration, okay? So now in order to have the privacy curve for the whole algorithm after a couple of thousands iteration, we have to talk about the composition. Okay, so now let's just talk about composition. Suppose we have two mechanisms, M1 and M2, and I know the privacy curve of each of them. So delta one and delta two are the privacy curve for these two mechanisms. Now, if I consider the composed um, um, uh, mechanism, so you know, composing M1 and, and M2, now the question is, what is the privacy curve of the composed mechanism? So can I, can I write it in terms of delta one and delta two or not? So, uh, so in, in general, you know, these two mechanisms can be kind of uh, interacting with each other. So um, that, that usually means, you know, we are, uh, we are talking about adaptive composition. Um, so, it, so suppose, you know, I know um, a pair of tightly, di uh, tightly dominating distribution for each of these two mechanisms. So P1, Q1, tightly dominates M1, and P2, Q2, tightly dominates M2. Uh, it's proved in this paper by Zhu et al. that, um, P1 times P2 and Q1 times Q2 dominates the composed mechanism. Not necessarily tightly dominate, but dominate uh, the, the composed mechanism. And what it says is that the privacy curve for the composed mechanism can be upper bounded by this hockeyistic divergence. And we already know that this hockeyistic divergence can be written uh, in terms of the expectation of the privacy loss random variable. Okay, so in this case, the privacy loss random variable becomes L1 plus L2, where now L1 is the privacy loss random variable for M1, and L2 is the privacy loss random variable for the second mechanism M2. Okay, so again, all we have to do, we have to compute the privacy loss random variable for each of them, and then uh, compute this expectation, and that gives us a very good upper bound for the privacy curve of the composing curve. The same um, holds for N mechanism. So if you look at you know, the uh, N-fold adaptive composition, the same thing happened. If I know um, tightly dominating distribution for each of these mechanism, M1, M2, and N, then the product of P and the product of Q will be uh, dominating distribution for the composed mechanism. And that tells us um, this upper bound um, for the privacy curve of the uh, N-fold composition. And uh, this expectation actually gives us, um, uh, you know, the same upper bound for the uh, for the privacy curve. Okay, so here uh, I'm looking at the sum of n privacy loss random variables. Okay, so uh, so we have this upper bound uh, for general uh, n full adaptive composition. So uh, here I'm looking at the sum of n privacy loss random variables. Okay, so there are several techniques, several methods in uh, in literature for um, upper bounding or approximating this uh, this expectation. So techniques like Thomas accountant, you know, Gaussian DP or central limit theorem based uh, algorithm. And the most 
uh, the most recent and the most uh, kind of well known um, um, uh, technique, you know, for for numerical composition is this uh, first uh, or or FFT based uh, algorithm, and uh, kind of you know the the state of the art is is this copy at all? You know, this is the one that I uh, that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Okay, so now it's time to to talk about the saddle point accountant, you know, this 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 new accountant. Um, okay, so let's just start from this uh, general upper bound that we just uh, uh, we just shown. Um, okay, so we have we have this expectation. Let me call this sum of n privacy loss random variable uh, L. Okay, so uh, remember that this L depends on n, but just to have an easier presentation, I just you know remove that that dependence on n. Okay, so by definition, this expectation is something like this. So I have I have this term, the positive part of this term times uh, the density of L, okay? So let me just do some very, very trivial things, okay? I can just multiply uh, e to the TL and e to the minus TL here, okay? So trivially, we still have this equality here, okay? So, um, and assume that, you know, T is just some arbitrary positive number, okay? So now let me do another trivial thing. I'm gonna just divide uh, this expected value of e to the TL and then multiply the same thing. So uh, this expected value of e to the TL, multiply and divide. Okay, so trivial so far. Uh, this, this term is moment generating function for, for random variable L. And this guy here um, can be considered as the PDF of um, exponentially tilted version of L. Where now the tilting parameter is this is this t here. Okay, so we call this exponentially tilted version of t uh, version of l. We call it by l tilde. So now I can just use you know this integral. I can denote it or I can write it uh, in terms of you know the density of l tilde. Okay. So now uh, let me bring some basic result from complex analysis, uh, which is Plantrol's theorem. Okay, so this theorem actually says that if I'm looking at the integral of product of two function, f times g, then this integral is is uh, is equal to uh, just the integral of the product of the Fourier transform. So this f of f is the Fourier transform of f, and this f of g is the Fourier transform of g, and this bar is just the uh, complex conjugate of the uh, Fourier transform. And then so we have this one over two pi here as well. So Applying this, this theorem, what we get uh, is this integral, um, which is basically the integral of some exponential function, where now the exponent is this, this function f, uh, f of epsilon, which is, which is something like this. Uh, and this, you know, the first term is the cumulant generating function, or CGF of L, which is, uh, which is defined as the logarithm of, uh, of this expected expectation. Okay, so essentially CGF is, the log of the moment generating function. Okay, so I'm, and I just evaluated that at some complex number z. Okay, so what I did so far is to represent this expectation in terms of this integral of some exponential function. Okay, let's just write it here. So uh, we have this upper bound for the privacy curve of the n fold composition account. Okay. So now our job is to kind of approximate this integral. And coincidentally, uh, this is exactly the goal of, of saddle point approximation in a statistic or, or statistical physics. Okay, so uh, if we have an integral of some exponential function where some function appears in the exponent, saddle point uh, approximation gives us a very, very powerful tool uh, to approximate that integral. Okay, so following this saddle point approximation, we take this tilting parameter t to be the saddle point of this function in the exponent, so f epsilon. And what do I mean by saddle point? Saddle point is the unique point t sub star satisfying this equation. So basically making the first derivative of uh, f epsilon uh, zero. Okay, and, and uh, equivalently, uh, saddle point solves this equation. And again, this is this is a unique uh, unique number satisfying this equation. Okay, so 
so at, at this point, you may wonder why this point is called saddle point. There is there is nothing so special about this point. Just you know, making the first derivative zero. Why it's called saddle point? Um, so let's just look at the second order Taylor expansion uh, of f around this saddle point. You know, around this t sub a star. Okay. So uh, this is this is the second order Taylor expansion. So along the real line. Um, we can show that you know this function f epsilon gets minimized at this point t sub star, and the reason for that is because we can show that you know this the second derivative of f is always positive because you know this function is strictly convex, and for any real line z, uh, this constant this coefficient actually is always positive. Um, so so yeah, so the the function f epsilon gets actually minimized at at the side of point t sub star. But parallel to imaginary axis, this coefficient here actually becomes negative. So this f epsilon gets maximized at this point t sub star. So this is actually the reason why we call this point saddle point. Okay, so now that we pick you know, one particular choice for this uh, tilting parameter t, uh, we propose two uh, approximation methods for um, approximating this, uh, this integral. Okay, so the first approach is vanilla saddle point approximation. We just you know follow saddle point approximation completely, and and it's uh, exactly about you know the second order uh, um, Taylor expansion of this function f. You know the uh, the the expansion that we just saw. Okay, so we pick we we, we just use this uh, approximation. We you know kind of plug it into this integral. We do some straightforward manipulation, and then we get some. Uh, uh, some kind of approximation for this integral. Um, the second approximation method is um, forget about uh, expanding the exponent. Okay, forget about that. Uh, what we do, we just basically just um, approximate uh, this CGF of f. And then we get some approximation for f epsilon, we plug it into this integral, and then uh, that gives us, you know, some uh, approximation for the integral. Okay, so so uh, by that I mean, you know, we are using the second order Taylor expansion of the CGF. Okay, so we will see that in a couple of minutes that these two approximation uh, leads to two different accountants coming from two completely different techniques, but numerically they are indistinguishable. Okay, both of them, in terms of you know DP accounting, they are. Uh, just you know, giving the same uh, result, even though they come from different techniques. Um, and the reason for having these two different techniques, these two different approximation methods, is because uh, this this one, as I mentioned, it's just vanilla saddle point approximation. It's been around for like 60, 70 years. Uh, the accuracy is known to be fantastic, but there are not that many results about the error analysis of this approximation. Okay, we we know some some result about the error of saddle point approximation, but but usually those results are not very um, very tight. Um, however, the second approximation method uh, can be naturally connected to central limit theorem and, and edgeward expansion. And for those kind of you know central limit theorem and edgeward, we know a great deal about uh, error analysis. For example, we know the various seen result, which gives us you know, a very kind of uh, nice uh, bound for the error term. Okay, so uh, what we are going to do, we are going to have two different accountants coming from these two techniques, uh, and then we will show numerically that you know they are uh, kind of indistinguishable. And then when when I talk about the error analysis, I just you know use uh, the second uh, accountant you know to to prove some some error analysis. I think we have a question. Yes. Hi, hi, Shahab. So I have a, how are you? I have a question about like. Uh, th this definition of this domi dominating measure. So, like intuitively, uh, so intuitively, it seems to me when you consider the dominating measure of each mechanism, and then mm -hmm. you state so for this for the for the composition part, and then you say that okay, this product measure is basically the dominating measure of the whole mechanism. It intuitively see like it's the feeling to me is that you basically don't take into account the adaptivity of this mechanism the fact that they're using the previous ones output so i just want to know intuitively like 
So, so um, yeah, yeah, a very good question. But but I think you know that adaptivity is kind of you know taken care of by by this result. You know, in this step, right? I mean, um, so so again, you know, we know that you know if I have some adaptivity between mechanism. Mm -hmm. Then, then we have this dominating distribution, and I think I think you know if the mechanisms are not adaptive, this will be the tightly dominating distribution instead of the dominating. Yeah, exactly. That's my question: is that if if you have like some sort of parallel composition compared to this adaptive, what is the difference between this? Stuff? I, I I think I'm not sure, but but intuitively I can say that you know if if we don't have adaptive composition. Then having tightly dominating for each mechanism gives gives us you know tightly dominating for the whole uh, composed mechanism. But for the adaptive Ooh. mechanism, we lose you know that that luxury. What if we don't have tightly dominating? Do we get this adaptive result? Oh, so we don't have tightly here. Yeah. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure. So if we don't have tightly here, then I don't think there is any chance that we get any tightly for the composed mechanism. That's that's my intuition. Right, right. But I mean, do do we do we still get an adaptive composition result? That that that's a good question. I'm 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 not sure. So yeah. So the question is, if we don't have tightly here, can we get this result? Um. I'm I'm I'm, I'm not sure. I, I I think we we need this tightly dominating here. Yeah, but 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 I'm not hundred percent sure that. Okay, um, so let me uh, let me just jump to where we were. Uh, where we were uh, in the. Okay, so just go. Okay, so uh, we talked about you know these two kind of approximation methods. Uh, one is vanilla cytochrome approximation. Another one is kind of related to edge word expansion. Okay, so now let's see what these two approximation methods gives us in terms of accounting uh, DP mechanism. Okay, so let me pick uh, the first uh, method. So again, uh, what I have to do, I have to pick this approximation, plug it into this uh, integral, and then do some kind of basic math. And uh, what I get is this approximation for the integral. Okay, you're just playing with the integral and um, yeah, so it's just it's just very simple kind of uh, manipulation, and so this is this is based on um, f of epsilon and the second derivative of uh, f epsilon, and we know exactly you know what this function is, so we can just uh, have an uh, kind of uh, uh, accountant in terms of just the KL, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, the CGF of that. Okay, so so now this is the first accountant of the DP mechanism that we have. Again, it involves the CGF of L. Evaluated at the saddle point and the second derivative of CGF. Okay, so this is the first accountant that we have. For the second accountant, uh, kind of you know the same methodology. You know we have this approximation for the CGF. We plug it here. We get some approximation for this function. We plug it here, and then we do some kind of uh, basic manipulation. And when we do, we get this kind of interesting representation for for the second accountant. So so we have this 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 term. Time this expectation. Okay, so this is this is the second accountant. So this expectation is uh, uh, is taken with respect to this random variable z, which is uh, a Gaussian random variable whose uh, first uh, moment and second moments are given in terms of the a CGF. So the first moment, you know, the mean uh, is the first derivative of CGF evaluated at the at the saddle point, and the variance of this uh, Gaussian random variable is. Uh, the second derivative of CGF evaluated at the saddle. Again, this expectation is actually can be computed analytic. So I just you know use this uh, this expectation just to have a more compact representation. Okay, so now I have two accountants. So let's just you know put them together you know in one single algorithm. This is the saddle point accountant algorithm. The inputs are um, tightly dominating pairs of distribution for each mechanism. So we have n mechanism. For each of them, we have one tightly pair of distribution, so P, I, Q, I. Um, and um, another piece of input is um, just uh, some range of epsilon. So in the first part of this algorithm, what we do, we compute or numerically estimate the CGF of uh, each of privacy loss random variable. Okay, And by definition, this is just the log of the 
uh, the MGF, you know, the moment generating function. Okay, so once we compute this or numerically estimate this, this CGF, we go to the second part, uh, which basically we just sum them up. And, and remember, you know, all these privacy loss, uh, loss random variable are independent. So when I sum them up, this actually gives us the CGF for, for L. Okay, so now I know CGF for, 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 for L now. What I can do now, I can basically just solve this equation uh, to compute the saddle point T sub a star. Okay, so now I know everything that I need. And now I can output these two accountants for, uh, for the n fold adaptive composition. So delta hat one and delta hat two are just two approximations for, um, uh, for the privacy guarantee of n fold composition. Um, so uh, before, before I show the performance of this, these two uh, accountants, let me just make a very quick remark. So if you look at this, uh, this term here, which is common between these two uh, accountants, uh, this is closely related to moments accountant. So moments accountant is exactly this. Uh, where instead of t sub a star, we have just t. And then we minimize this exponential over all possible values of t. Okay, so that, that is the whole point of, you know, moments accounting. So um, this term actually appears here. So that kind of gives us some sort of informal intuition about, you know, this to side point accounting. So side point accounting can be, uh, can be considered or can be thought of as corrected version of moments accounting, where, um, the correct the correction term in this in this case is you know this this huge uh, denominator and then for the second one the correction term is basically this expectation okay so now let's just uh, have a comparison between um, state of the art or FFT moments accountant uh, and side point accountant so again uh, the moments accountant uh, we all know that you know is uh, is kind of loose upper bound for the uh, for the privacy. Uh, for the privacy care, um, and, and uh, as I showed at the beginning, side point accountant kind of you know sits in bit between the lower bound and upper bound. But what is interesting here is that I'm showing both of these two side point accountant, delta hat one and delta hat two, but they are kind of sitting right on top of each other, each other. So you cannot really distinguish them. So I just use this SPA to denote both of them. So the, third thing, the, the fourth thing that, that I'm showing in this plot is the true value of that integral. So remember, we have this integral uh, for the upper bound of the privacy curve. Okay. So to have a better uh, comparison uh, of this side point uh, accountant, I'm computing or numerically uh, computing this integral. So using some Gaussian quadrature, uh, I can numerically compute this integral and I, and I show it in this plot by, by this point, uh, and I call it truth. Okay, so, and, and again, as, as you can see, truth are exactly just following, you know, the silent point account. So that, that gives us, you know, some kind of uh, confidence in uh, silent point account. Okay, so this is epsilon versus number of compositions. Now let's just go to delta versus epsilon. Um, again, moments accountant is a, kind of a crude upper bound. Um, and then uh, this is a dashed, um, blue curves are lower bound or upper bound from Gopi et al. or FFT. Um, and then the yellow curve is the silent point accountant. Again, you know, both of them are kind of you know, sitting on top of each other. So it's not easy to distinguish them. And then again, truth uh, kind of following, you know, the silent point accountant. So, and again, so this, this, uh, this kind of breaking point happens here, you know, at delta equal to 10 to minus nine. But for side point accountant, you know, it, it doesn't happen. So we can just cover, you know, any possible values of epsilon and delta. Uh, okay, so that's that's all I wanted, you know, for, for the numerical uh, experiment. Uh, there are more experiments, you know, in the paper, uh, more detailed, you know, different kind of uh, range of parameters. You can check out uh, the paper. But now if I have time, I can talk about, you know, the error analysis here uh, very quickly. So, um, so as, as I mentioned, you know, I have this upper bound for, uh, for, uh, for the privacy care. Uh, and I propose, you know, two kinds of, you know, approximation method. Uh, the first one is vanilla side point approximation. Uh, the second one is kind of related to edgeward expansion or central limit theorem. And, I, and I, as I mentioned, you know, the first one is not, is not great for error analysis because we don't have so many tools, you know, for error analysis of, of silent point approximation. However, for, for the second one, you know, we have many, many tools you know, for, for error analysis, for example, you know, Barry C. So uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just, you know, 
you take you know various in result and then just plug it into this uh, accountant coming from the second methods and then show some some error analysis. So when I do uh, when I follow this various scene, this is actually what I get. So the gap between the true value of the integral and the second accountant is upper bounded by this kind of monster um, uh, monster term, uh, which depends on the CGF of L, the saddle point T sub a star, and this term P uh, sub T a star, which is basically uh, the sum of uh, absolute, uh, the, the sum of uh, third moment uh, term absolute moment uh, for the uh, uh, for the tilted version of privacy loss random variable. Okay, so this is this is actually what you expect, you know, from various in theorem. Okay, so the dependence uh, um, of the error term on n kind of here is uh, in this, you know, the the CGF of L. Remember, you know, L depends on n. So to have a better understanding of, you know, how uh, the error actually decays, uh, let's just, you know, pick this particular choice of epsilon. So epsilon uh, increases with L according to this, uh, to this formula. So epsilon is equal to the expected value of uh, L plus some constant B times the variance of L. Okay, so if epsilon behaves something like this, you know, for some constant B, so even B, you know, can be a function of N, um, then, uh, then the error term is actually something like you know, c over root n, and, and this c just depends on this constant b. And again, this is you know what you expect you know from uh, uh, from central limit theorem and various. Okay, so uh, let's just see how this error term compares with the error term with the error analysis of uh, the Gopi et al. Okay, so this is this is the plot. So here, um, again, uh, the upper bound and lower bound of Gopi et al are given in this blue dashed line. And then um, the error term that we have, the error uh, analysis that we have is uh, in this uh, turquoise uh, dashed line. And as you can see, for this range of parameters, the error uh, bound that we have uh, is much better than the error bound given by Gopi et al. Okay, but I have to, I have to say uh, something here. So, for this choice of parameters, our error term is better than Gopi et al. But if you play with different kind of uh, range of parameters, their bound you know, might become better. But but the approximation itself is always better than than Gopi et al. The error term might not, but the approximation itself is always better than Gopi et al. Okay, so that's that's all I had. Uh, let me just wrap up. Um, so uh, I introduced uh, a new framework for numerical um, uh, composition algorithm uh, for DP mechanism based on uh, standard point approximation. And then I showed that, you know, the, the accuracy is compatible with the state of the art. Uh, the runtime complexity, however, is very different, is independent of, uh, of the number of composition. Uh, and it works for all epsilon and delta. Again, unlike the state of the art, uh, this algorithm uh, works for all values of epsilon and delta. So there are some challenges that, that we are currently working on. Uh, the first thing is, um, so all, all recent uh, composition result on, uh, you know, in, the, in the DP literature, they built on that notion of tightly dominating distribution. But as, as we talked about, uh, we don't have tightly dominating distribution for the composed mechanism. Okay? We have dominating distribution for the mechanism. So now the question is, is there any way that we can get some tight dominating distribution for the for the composition. If we have some understanding of the tightly dominating distribution for the composed mechanism, then that might lead to uh, potentially a very good uh, kind of uh, you know tighter result for the composition. So the second thing that we are currently working on is uh, having a better error analysis for um, for for our work. Uh, again, this is not always better than Gopi at all. So we definitely need to improve you know our uh, error analysis. And then uh, the third point is um, the bottleneck of saddle point accountant is computing the CG, co computing the cumulative generating function for L. If we can have uh, a better, more efficient estimator for CGF, that actually leads to a much faster algorithm uh, in our case. So this is this is actually what I'm, what we are actually working on this day. So you can see. Um, uh, the draft, you know, in archive. Uh, this is the QR code, you know, for the paper. Uh, there are um, so here I talked about two 
uh, saddle point accountant. Uh, in paper, you know, we have actually three, and then the, the third one is uh, a little bit messier, uh, but it's much better than you know even uh, you know the first two. Um, it's basically based on instead of looking at the second order Taylor expansion, we look at you know, the third order Taylor expansion, and then you know that gives us you know, something much better with not too much more complexity. It's just a little bit marginally more complex, but the accuracy is much better. So uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions. If you